Good morning. Welcome to Dalewood Baptist Church. It is so good to see each and every one of you here this morning. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, For those of you in the building, it's great to see you in person. And for those of you joining us online, we're so thankful for you as well. Um, We're going to take some time to worship together. Uh, We're going to sing a song called Power in the Blood. So I'd love if you'd stand and sing with me as we worship together. power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the you be free from your passion and pride. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come forth, cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. Let me hear you sing it out. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. One more time. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. We uh, come to a, a highlight in our service. We can pray for others, friends of ours, comforting to, uh, those and our church members and things like that. So we want to we want to take some time to pray for those this morning. Just want to highlight a few. Tom uh, Tom Odom, you know Tom had some tests last Tuesday. He had uh, two of three that he was supposed to get, waiting on the insurance to clear it. But uh, he's supposed to have his uh, CAT scan this coming. Tuesday or Wednesday, I believe, Wednesday. But uh, we want to pray for he and Linda as they go to that. And, uh, you know, he's had a couple of events over the last year where he's had uh, it's kind of like a mini stroke. That's kind of what they declared. So we want to pray uh, not that they find something, but if they do, then they can treat it in a way that will uh, help, him, help him in the future days. Uh, Elizabeth has a uh, brother on her backside, friends and family, Mickey Ledbetter. He's going to be in Nashville here at Vanderbilt this week, too, for, uh, for some further testing, so we want to pray for him. Uh, Kenneth's brother, Johnny Reeder, uh, just uh, having some tough days, and we want to lift him up and pray for him. And I'm sure many of you have uh, concerns, and even your own personally, a friend that you have and maybe you hadn't mentioned, but we want to just take the time to bring all those into one just one together 
and so we can all pray for them and uh, we'll do that just in a minute but uh, I want to read a scripture which uh, kind of relates to the physical needs of folks it's called rewired by gratitude after being diagnosed with a brain tumor Christina Costa noticed how much of the talk around facing her cancer is dominated by the language of fighting she found that this metaphor quickly started to feeling exhausting. She didn't want to spend over a year at war with her own body. Instead, what she found most helpful were daily practices of gratitude for the team of professionals caring for her and also for the ways that her brain and body were showing healing. She experienced firsthand that no matter how difficult the struggle, practices of gratitude can help us to resist depression and wire our brains to help us build res resilience in the future days. Costa's powerful story reminded me that practicing gratitude is, isn't just something believers do out of a duty. Although it's true that God deserves our gratitude, it's also profoundly good for us also. When we lift up our hearts to say, praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, we're reminded of the countless ways that God's at work every day, assuring us of his forgiveness, working healing in our bodies and our hearts, and letting us experience love and compassion and countless good things in his creation. While not all suffering will find complete healing in this lifetime, our hearts can always be renewed by gratitude for God's love with us from everlasting to everlasting. Now let's pray. Father, we do come to you, Lord, with our time today to pray for those that we care about, pray for those that we love, Father. And even many we don't know, know, we call their names, but Father, we know we may not know them, but we know that you do in every way. So, Father, we lift up Tom, we lift up Mickey. Lift up Johnny to you today, Lord, and others that are on our list. Surely Russell, Father, for those who have come through things in the past and are looking to the future for your continued grace and compassion. So, Father, we just pray for all of them as their tests come about, as their future is in uh, question here on this side of heaven, Father. But we pray, Father, that uh, those days would be better and they would look to you for that grace and confidence. So we ask it all in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. As we continue to worship together, uh, you know, we lift up these prayer requests, and I know many of us come this morning with heavy hearts because of things going on maybe in your life or the life of someone that you know, and we don't want to just ignore that. Uh, during our time of worship because we know it's still on your heart. And so as we pray for those things, I think this song is a great reminder uh, that we can trust in God because he never fails. So no matter what's going on, uh, we can still trust in him. Would you stand as we continue to worship together? Sing with me. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood, and what he did for me. Calvary is more than enough. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior, the one. Faith. 
perfect submission all is at rest I know the author of tomorrow has ordered my steps so this is my story and this is my song My Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God. My Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never Never fail. Sing with me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. 
Father, we come here to praise, honor, and worship your holy name. We pray for these tithes and gifts that they may be used to further your kingdom. We always want to play, pray for the gift and the giver. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen. You can be seated as we take our offering together. You turn into wine, open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. There's none like you. Into the dark. 
darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power, our God, our God. Into the darkness we shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. None like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power, our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God. Our God, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? Our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Let's sing that together one more time. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power, our God, our God. Amen. Thanks for your time of worship together. Uh, today we have a special guest. Some of you may have met him last week. His name is Josh Lansford, and so I'm excited to introduce him this morning. So Josh, we'd love if you'd come and share with us this morning. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you guys for letting me come and uh, share with you all this morning. So we're in Hebrews. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 1. Let me just work through this, this passage. It's 
Hebrews chapter 1. I'll read just the first few, uh, four verses. We're going to actually look at the whole chapter, and then I'll, I'll pray for us. Let's, let's read. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your word. We're so thankful for the opportunity to fellowship together as brothers and sisters God, we thank you that we can uh, look at your word and that from your word we learn about the sufficiency of Christ, the sufficiency of the gospel. God, that we can be encouraged by your word, we can be changed by your word, we can, we can, we can uh, gain boldness and confidence by your word. And so God, I pray that as we look at your word, you would just fill uh, us with your spirit, you would open our eyes that we may behold things that we've never seen before. And God, you would just open the word to us and teach us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So you probably, I know growing up in church, which I feel like um, a, lot of, um, a lot of churches in the South are like this. We've probably heard, a, it's a great like, preacher story. It's about Robert Robinson. He wrote the, the hymn, uh, Come Thou Fount uh, of Every Blessing. And so there, there were moments in his life where I think he really struggled with his faith. He wrote this beautiful hymn, and it's encouraging for all of us because we see how God worked in his life through this beautiful hymn, but also knowing that there were these moments where he most likely really struggled with who he was in Christ and struggled with his calling, and even as maybe a believer. Well, he's on a train one day. He's going somewhere. I don't, I don't know where he's going. And uh, he, he overhears this lady, and she's singing. And you know what, what she's singing, right? She gets to these, these verses. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He, to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace now, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. And he overhears this lady seeing that, and he's just reminded of God's grace and what God had done in his past and how God had allowed him to sing that. I, I don't know the rest of the story. I don't know if he talked to the lady and told him. I, I assume he did. But I thought, what well, just a beautiful story about uh, even God's grace in arresting a person's heart even as they are fleeing from God. When we look at Hebrews, we see a people that this author is writing to who are probably facing some of the same things that uh, Robert Robinson faced. Like they're facing external pressures. They're facing because of those external pressures inner turmoil. And so these recipients of this letter are wrestling with this temptation to drift away from the gospel, to drift away from the, 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 the Jesus that they had given their lives to most likely these guys are Jewish uh, Christians so at some point along their journey they had left Judaism they were following Christ and and as we'll look we'll see that they most likely were facing some external pressure from maybe parents from family from the government from those around them and and in facing those things they were one they were being drawn back to 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 uh, to, to Judaism they were dr being drawn away from the gospel so maybe the allure, the familiar comforts of the law was alluring them. Maybe it was the, just the clear rituals, the tangible righteousness that they could see. It all tugged at their hearts. These early believers facing persecution and isolation uh, could easily have seen the law as this like refuge of righteousness, a way to, to cover their own shame and, and really just a method to prove that they were valuable in a world that was rejecting them. Um, their hearts were prone to wonder. They were faced uh, with this temptation to find solace in what they once knew. And it really reminds me 
of how we live in this world. Like all of us were called out of worldviews that 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 still seep into our hearts and our minds. We were all called out of ideologies that that showed us that that this is the way you can find value in this world. This is the way you can cover your shame. This is the way that you can prove yourself and prove your righteousness and prove that you belong. Like all of us were called out of those worldviews and ideologies. And we were all called to put our confidence and our faith and trust in Christ and in Christ alone. But when those external pressures hit us and those inner turmoils begin to flare up, we all have this tendency to drift back to that place where maybe we're trusting in, and hey, I just need to live this life of being happy. If I can just be happy, then, then, then God's, God's good and, and God's, God's, God created me and God's out there and he's not really personable and he's not, he doesn't have this relationship with me. He's just out there. He just wants my life to be happy. He wants, he wants everything just to be peaceful. And we fall into that trap. We fall into the trap of consumerism that really where we're seduced into this, this idea that if we could just acquire more stuff, then we're going to feel satisfied with our lives. We're going to uh, sh- show how valuable and how good we are if we just acquire more stuff. We fall into the trap of, of secular humanism that, hey, human effort alone, I can, achieve, I can achieve perfection if I just work hard enough, if I try hard enough. We fall into the trap of... of new age spirituality where we just turn inside of our hearts. We, we face external pressures. We just turn inside and we just say, oh, if the universe would just help me. And we just, we just think about, oh, if I could just get away and, and ha- find uh, peace and rest and solace, I would be okay. I'm positive. <laughs> you know what I really feel is, as I've grown up just it's in the Southern Baptist Church and Southern Baptist life, I, I see this often that we fall into this trap of really self-helpism of works righteousness. We say, hey, if I could just if I could just show myself how valuable I am to God, like if I could just prove to God how good I am, then God will bless me. If I could just prove to God how how righteous I am, then God will be pleased with me. If I could just show God how by my works I'm really a good person, then God will see value in me. It's very similar as I was growing up as a little boy. I remember we'd go to this church and I remember I asked my my Paul, my granddad, hey Paul, I just noticed that all of the people I go to church, we go to church with, they all have, have nice cars and nice stuff. And I just got this impression in my mind that if I just follow these rules and I went down this path, then all of this stuff will just come to me. And that's what I was kind of as a little boy living for. But you know what? I can fall back into that trap. I can face the external pressure. I can feel this inner turmoil. I face, oh, I can't, I can't pay this bill. Or, oh, I, I, I can't do this. Or, or what? And I feel this, or I'm, I'm facing some, some friction, some, 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 some persecution. Oh, there's something wrong. I'm doing something wrong. And there's this inner turmoil. And I go back and I say, God, what am I doing wrong? Why aren't you blessing me? God, I've been doing as much as I can. And you're not giving me anything. I go back into that same past that I've trusted in so long and we all can get there maybe it's a call from a doctor or it's it's a financial issue or it's a parenting issue or it's a it's a spousal issue and we run back but God I've been working so hard I've been doing this and and I I don't have anything we are very similar when we face the heat of that external pressure we either produce thorns or we produce fruit and we do either one of those because of what we've been putting inside what we've been reflecting on what we've been meditating on what we've been focusing on so today i want to look in hebrews at four things four attributes of christ and i want to show you why christ will satisfy our deepest longings why christ and christ alone is enough So we're going to see these four attributes of Christ. We're going to look at one, just one response, and I'm going to give you one tool. So let's just start. Why does Christ satisfy our deepest longings? Well, let's look. Verse 1, long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So Jason actually, um, so... I know we all have like New Year's resolutions. I've had this same New Year's resolution like every year, I think, since I got saved, which has been a long, long time. And um, 
And so I want to, one day I want to memorize a large book of the Bible. Hebrews is a great, Hebrews was like a sermon. And it's really written to be almost like a sermon. Like you could read it like a sermon. I feel like that's what it was given as, was a sermon. And so I've tried before and have tried this year to memorize Hebrews. I've failed already. <laughs> and I'm going to fail this year. But, but it's okay. There's no condemnation. So I say that because when Jason was, he was like, hey, do you want to preach? I was like, well, I've been trying to memorize Hebrews, so this would be perfect. And then it fits into what he talked about last week and what I think he had been talking about the week prior. So here is the writer of Hebrews, and he's saying many times in many ways, which is this idea of many times in many ways is, is as if God has spoken in fragments throughout history. So he's spoken at times in the law. He's spoken uh, in, in, in writings. He's spoken through the prophets. He's spoken in piecemeal ways, showing us almost like puzzle pieces of what this, uh, of what, what his purpose and his vision for all of creation was. And so that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. He's saying in many ways and at many times, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Um, the Lord used this idea of many times and in many ways to really give us this idea that the truth of God's plan was being revealed in parts. Turn with me over to Numbers chapter 12 and we'll see uh, just some of the ways God spoke. So Numbers chapter 12 is to your, to your left. Numbers 12 and we're going to look at verse 6. Numbers 12 verse 6 says, Hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him, notice, in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. It's one of the ways God spoke. Not so with my servant Moses, but no, with Moses, he's faithful in all my house. With him, I speak mouth to mouth, clearly and not in riddles. And he beholds the form of the Lord. And so here's this idea. How does God speak? Well, he speaks in dreams and visions, mouth to mouth. We see that throughout the Old Testament that God is speaking to prophets, the law, and to Moses. And then look over in Luke. So you're going back to the New Testament. Luke 24, 44. Luke 24, 44 says this. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So God, back to Hebrews, God has spoken in many times and in many ways to our fathers by the prophets. The purpose of him speaking in the past. Well, through the law, what does God do? God reveals his holiness. God reveals his, 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 his mercy. Like God reveals that even though you are disobeying my commands, I'm going to show you mercy. I've made a covenant with you. I'm going to keep that covenant. I'm a steadfast God, loving steadfastly. Uh, we see in, in the law, God's hatred of sin. You open up to Leviticus 27 and you find that, that God hates sin so much that he says, if you keep going down this path, you're going to get to a point where I'm going to turn you over and you're just going to eat the flesh of your children. Like God hates sin. That's what the law reveals to us. In, in the, the prophets, we see God's purpose for all creation, God's goal for all creation. We see the promise of a kingdom where God rules forever. And then in the writings, we see God bears our pain, that God leads us to find joy and peace. But what does the writer of Hebrews say? He's spoken uh, in the past in many ways, but in these last days, how, what has he done? He has spoken to us by his son. Like there is this one definitive fulfilling way that God has spoken to us, and that is through Christ. And so when we open the Old Testament, when we open the entirety of Scripture, we see this book written about one hero who comes to save us. In fact, we could go 
really all the way back to the beginning. And we remember that what happens? God creates this world. He puts Adam and Eve in the garden. He says, Adam and Eve, you can eat from any tree in the garden except the one, the, no, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the day that you eat from that, you will surely die. Well, sure enough, we know. They eat from the tree. And so they go and they realize their, their sinfulness. And so what do they do? They take fig leaves and they, they, they put fig leaves together and they try to clothe themselves with fig leaves. They try to cover their shame with fig leaves. They go back to maybe an ideology that they had, I don't know, dreamed up that, hey, I could cover my shame by my own efforts. And so what does God do? God comes into the garden. They hide behind a tree. God finds them. He talks to Adam and Eve. He curses the ground, curses them. He looks at the serpent and he said, hey, there's going to come one from the seed of the woman that will come. You'll bruise his heel and he's going to crush your head. And then what happens? Well, we get, we get Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden. Well, God kills an animal. Like the, the forgiveness of sin only comes through the shedding of blood. The covering of our shame only comes through the shedding of blood. What a picture of Jesus. But what happens then? So you get Cain and Abel. And, and you're like, well, maybe Cain and Abel are the ones that will come and crush the head of the serpent. Maybe they'll come and they'll, they'll be the ones that will, will bring us victory out of this sin that Adam and Eve got us into. Well, they don't. We know they, Cain kills Abel. And then what do we get? We get, we get Noah. Noah's raised up. He's a righteous man. He builds a, an ark. The, the, the world's destroyed. He is saved. Maybe Noah is the one who will crush the head of the serpent. But no, we know Noah's a sinner. Noah doesn't crush the head of the serpent. And then what happens? Well, Abraham is this beautiful promise. Is Abraham the one? No, you can't treat your wife like that. Abraham's not the one. Isaac, maybe Isaac is the one. No. And time after time, man after man, rises up. Oh, there's Saul. The Israelites have, have longed for a king, and Saul's a real tall guy. He's hiding in the luggage over there. But God said he's the king, and maybe he's the one. And he's not the one. Ah, oh, but David, God is so pleased with David. A man after God's heart. Maybe David's the one. I can keep going around, but no, they're none of the one. They're not the one. But, but then, and then what happens? The prophets, they say, hey, one is coming. But then Ezekiel, Ezekiel said, I searched for a man among them to make up the hedge. This is what God says, to stand in the gap. And he says, I found none. And we're just left with these promises in the prophets that the people of God are going to be restored. The people of God are going to find one who's going to come like, like a silent lamb and he's going to die for them and he's going to serve them and he's going to be their king. He, they're going to be restored. But then there is silence. Jason mentioned it last week, but 400 years of silence. Imagine that. 400 years without a paycheck? That would be rough, right? 400 years without, without, without talking to the one you love? 400 years of just silence. And it was the most deafening silence in all of the world. And it was interrupted by Jesus. Jesus who came, who is, who is the fulfillment of every word in Scripture. Like this book is completely, entirely about him. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke through the prophets to our fathers. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Christ is the eternal word. He is the fulfillment of every spoken word to our fathers by the prophets. Christ is the picture on the puzzle box. He puts it all together. Notice this, though, Christ is the creator. He's the heir of all things. That's what the writer continues, and he says, uh, he appointed him the heir of all things, through whom he also, or also he created the world. So turn with me over to Colossians, Colossians 1. Colossians 1, it's just to the left. We're going to be in verse 16 and 18, 16 through 18. Colossians 1, verses 16 through 18. For by him, 
by Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything uh, he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So here is Colossians, very similar to Hebrews. That What we're learning here is that Christ is the heir of all things. Everything in this world was created for the glory, for the worship of Christ. Everything in this world points us to Christ. He is preeminent. He's the most important character in all things. And not only that, he created the world. He is above all things. He created all things. He is supreme. And it's the supremacy of Christ that fuels us uh, when, when we are facing challenges and we're facing heartache. It is this supremacy of Christ that fuels us to have hope even in the midst of our deepest struggles. And that's exactly where the Hebrews were. The Hebrews, they're the Christians here, these Christians were struggling with some hard things. They were having their houses taken from them. They were seeing their friends put in prison. They had, they had seen some of their friends die. They were at a place where they were not certain that this Christ, this, this Christ that they were following was truly the fulfillment of God's word. They were struggling. They were at a place that we all can get. And what did they need? They needed to know that Christ was the creator of all things and that he, uh, that everything was created for him and for his glory. They needed to know what Paul needed to know. When Paul is like, I am struggling with this thorn in my flesh. And God, I have prayed over and over and over for you to remove that. Whatever, whatever that was, was it a temptation? Was it a sickness? Was it a relationship issue? Whatever that was, was it a, a struggle with, with, with sin? Whatever that was, God, I have asked over and over and over, remove this from me. And God said, no. And God said, because when you are weak, that's when I'm strong. That's when I'm working. My grace is sufficient for you. And as we learn that Christ is the creator of all things and all things are created for him, then we understand that when we are weak, it's then we're strong because it's God's grace. It's Christ and Christ alone that's sufficient for us. We don't need to prove ourselves. We don't need to, to work to please God. He is pleased with us. We have proved ourselves because of Jesus. It is his grace. That's all we need. That is good news. That is the greatest news of the gospel, that in the midst of our confusion, when our world crumbles around us, Christ remains. Over in Hebrews 12 and verse 1, the writer says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So when everything around us in this broken world falls away. When loved ones leave us and dreams are shattered, know that Christ remains. Cling to him and know that he is in control. That's where the writer of Hebrews is starting us. Cling to Christ in the midst of the chaos. We attend a small group on Sunday nights uh, at our church and um, and tonight we're starting a book called uh, The Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges. I like that book because I've read it before. It's a good practical book on, guess what, Pursuing Holiness. <laughs> and that's the title. And um, so it's a good, it's a short book. If you're looking for a book to read, you should just pick it up. It's real easy to read. And, um, but it also brings back good me memories that I, that I had. I, when I, li I lived in Montgomery, all, all, two of my kids, oldest ones, are born in Montgomery and um, Alabama. And when we lived there, I was pastoring this church, and uh, I had two goals there. One goal was to uh, to really invest in 
uh, the men that were there in the church and just to pour in them, let them pour in me. Like, just create that good relational time where we're reading stuff together. So we read that book together. We read the Bible together. We talked about our families, we talked about just growing as men and, and stuff. And then uh, another goal I had was to see, um, to see a church. So it was Montgomery, Alabama, sort of the birthplace of the civil rights movement. It's amazing, like, that the, the like, racial reconciliation stuff really uh, hung like a cloud over that city. Uh, just, there was a lot of struggle still today, I, I guess, but, but when I was there, it was still just a struggle. And so as pastors, we'd get together, we'd put a lot of praying for racial reconciliation. And so for me, I was in a very diverse neighborhood, it was a diverse city. I just was like, uh, I just, I really wanted, a goal was like, I wanted our church to reflect the diversity of, of our city and of our neighborhood. And um, so I prayed for that, and we, you know, whatever. It never really happened. We had, you know, I mean, there's several sort of white families, we had a few black families. Uh, in that group, I had, uh, I had, oh, Four, four white guys and a black guy. And uh, the black guys, Keith, uh, the Stovall family, they were like fantastic. Keith uh, served in our Awana ministry and was just really just loved the Lord. And uh, so he loved the Lord. And um, so uh, no, hold on a second. Um, but he, he loved the Lord. And so we were reading this book together. And um, so I actually res- resigned. My goal was to go. Man, I'm sorry. Uh, so my goal was to uh, to see this church be diverse. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I, I resigned. I was going to Austin to do some church planting. And, and that Sunday that I told him, I was like, Keith came up to me and was like, hey, I'd like to talk to you this week. I was like, yeah, that's, that's fine. So Tuesday rolled around. And, uh, and what, Tracy and I were going to dinner. And I got a call from another guy in the group. He's like, Hey, um, you need to go to the hospital. Keith has been, he got a wreck with his motorcycle, and he, he's, he's there. And so, so I went back. And you never know, like, how pressing the situation is. And this guy, uh, I was like, I don't know if it was that pressing. Well, I got there, and his wife was in shock, and Keith was dead. And, um, and I saw, so I hugged his wife. I saw Keith lying there. Man, I was just, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I, like, I've told this story multiple times, and it always gets me. But, um, but I, I, it was just, I was so upset and confused. I mean, they, Keith, 46, a couple boys. One boy just graduated from TSU a couple years ago. But what, like, just a great man of God. And, um, and the, and then, so then what happened is a couple of days later, we have the funeral. And uh, I walk in through doors. Our doors were on the side. It was a round room, and it, it seated probably about the same. I mean, we never filled up. We were always a real small group. But I remember just walking in and just looking. And it was like, it was like everything that, that I, I really had been praying for and, and dreaming about. Like, here was this, this room that was very diverse, and we were gathering around, yeah, we were gathering around the life of a man who loved the Lord, but we were gathering around an opportunity to hear the gospel. And to me, it was like this, it's like Revelation 5 and 7, which I think is like one of the most beautiful pictures in all of the Bible, where you have a people from different languages and tribes and nations and tongues gathered around the throne of Christ. And they're gathered around not because they all speak the same language or all look the same or all make the same amount of money or all from the same country. They're gathered around the throne of Christ because of the gospel and because of the power of Jesus Christ. They're gathered around because a creator created them and everything is created for him. And so no matter what we face, whether we face the joys of, 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 uh, of bringing a new child home or the, the pain of losing a good friend, like whatever we face is created for the glory 
in the edification of Jesus Christ. So what do we learn about Christ? Well, we learn that he is the fulfillment of everything. We learn that he created everything and everything is created for him. And then we learn, look at verse 3, that he is the radiance of God's glory. So what we see in Hebrews 1, 3 is that God, that Christ is divine. We see the divine nature of God. God always has been. Christ always has been. God has always existed as one and has always existed as three persons, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Wayne Grudem says there is no difference in deity, attributes, or essential nature between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each person is fully God and has all the attributes of God. And here in Hebrews 1, verse 3, we see this beautiful picture of of the author telling us that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. He shines the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of his nature. And notice this, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. He's the sustainer of creation. Um, In the Old Testament, uh, we see, as we talked about, Uh, here he is the radiance of the glory of God exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power notice this as we continue after making purification for sins he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high I think when I think about Jesus uh, being the radiance of God's glory I think about the, 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 the really the passion that God has for saving his people for bringing redemption about and so when I look at he made purification for sins and then he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high that Jesus has come to purify a people for himself Jesus has come to make us holy Jesus has come to set us apart as God's People, Look over with me at Hebrews chapter uh, 10. Look at what Jesus has done. Hebrews 10 and verse 11. Well, let's look at verse, verse 8 and then we'll read. And when, he, when uh, he said above, you have neither desire nor taking pleasures in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. Uh, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I've come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. In verse 10, And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Notice this, once for all. So what does Christ do? He comes to purify a people. He comes to set us apart, to make us holy. Verse 11, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Why? Because it's over. That's such good news. You and I do not have to live in this perpetual cycle of trying to make God happy with us. It's over. God is happy with you through Jesus. God is happy with his son. His son has pleased him. His son has proven himself to to him. His son has done everything required for, 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 for life and godliness. His son has lived the victorious Christian life. You know what you and I are called to do? We are called to turn with all of our efforts and just look to the son. That's all we're called to do. Just to repent of everything else that we're holding on to prove how good we are and how right we are. And just to turn and say, Jesus, I'm giving you everything. You are all I need. And we know he's all that we need because he has fulfilled every word from God. We know he is all we need because he is the one who who has created all things and through whom everything is created for. He is the one who has come to, to, um, to, 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 to do that third He is the radiance of God's glory. And then finally, what does the writer say? He is superior to angels. And so verse four says, Um, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So the Son of God, as we continue, if you continue down, you would see that the Son of God is, is to, 
his to be served and to bring to be honored and to be glorified. The Son of God is to be worshipped, and that stands in stark contrast to the angels. So um, let's just read through how much better Jesus is, and then we're going to get to the last point here. For to which of the angels, verse 5, did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes the angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, look at this, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is a scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. When we, when we ask, hey, David is not a good king because he failed, but who is a good king? Jesus is. He has loved righteousness. He has hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But guess what? You are the same and your years have no end. And to the which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? No, they're just all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. Who is that? Who is to inherit salvation? Well, every believer Every, every son and daughter of God, every, every person who has repented of their sin and put their trust in Jesus Christ. Do you realize what that means for us? What that means for us is that we can stand in boldness. If we're a follower of Jesus, we can stand in boldness, knowing that God has filled us with the Holy Spirit and that God has given us his revealed word and God has put us in a place and he's called us righteous and then he's given us a mission to be ambassadors of Christ in the place that we live. Like we are not just people sitting here weak and weary. We are filled with the Spirit, empowered men and women of God. We are soldiers and ambassadors of Christ and we can boldly have no fear because because really the only one we're to fear is God and and Jesus has fully walked in complete fear of God and so through faith in Jesus I, I, I don't have to live in trepidation of God like Jesus frees me from everything I look to Jesus and I'm filled with boldness. And through Jesus, we boldly can, can live and have our being and we boldly can know God is at work in our lives. And so what, is, what does the writer of Hebrews do? This is the calling, chapter two, verse one. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. You and I, we'll face, as we go today, this week, we will face external pressure. That will create inner turmoil. We will be tempted, like we're tempted every day, to run back to what we've trusted in forever. Our own works, our own righteousness. We'll, be, we'll run back and we'll say, hey, I'm just gonna, just gonna live life, just gonna be happy. I really just, I just wanna have power, I wanna do whatever. And Jesus says, no. Don't, don't go that way. Repent and don't forget what you've heard. Don't forget Christ. Don't forget the fulfilled word. Don't forget the creator, the sustainer. Don't forget the radiance of the glory of God. Don't forget the one who is greater than angels. Don't forget Christ. So I want to give you one tool to take this week as you live in this world. And you can remember this tool by the word swap. So swap. So as you go this week, I want you to practice a habit of surrendering every day to Christ. Surrendering, turning from that way, turning to Christ every day. Surrendering. I mean, just do it at your house. You don't have to do, come here and turn, surrender. Wait on God in prayer, W. Wait on God in prayer. So every day, I'm going to pray. I'm going I'm to give God adoration. I'm going to confess my sins to God. I'm going to show my thankfulness to God. I'm going to pray for other peoples. I'm going to wait on God in prayer. 
I'm going to avoid any sin, hint of sin. So A, avoid any hint of sin. I'm going to, now I know God is holy and daily. I'm going to put off sin and I'm going to put on its holy opposite. And then P, I'm just going to trust in these prompted responses. Like I'm going to be ready to worship. I'm going to be ready to pray daily and when I need to pray. So I want to hear from God and I want to worship God. I want to hear from God and I want to be thankful to God. I want to hear from God and I want to give God his, his glory. So we worship because of God's grace and goodness. So what do we do? We cling to Jesus. We swap, surrender, wait on God in prayer, avoid any hint of sin and prompted responses. Listen, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then really today is the day of salvation. We all do have a God we worship. We all do have an ideology and a worldview that we follow. All of us are naturally idol makers and idol worshipers. Our hearts are idol factories. That's just normal. That's who we are. And we are called, all of us, to repent of the idols that we worship and turn to Jesus. Jesus said, if any, if, Jesus said that, that, that I, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So if you don't know Jesus today, today is a day to turn from everything else that's perishing and to trust Jesus. And if you're a believer today, know that you and an unbeliever, you, we, we're all the same. we all still are idol worshipers. And every day we have to practice that habit of turning from everything else we're trusting in and turning to Christ. Keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him did not deny uh, Took, oh, oh my bad. Uh, t- 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 took up the cross and, and carried our shame. I don't think that's right. But, uh, but um, anyway, thank you guys. I'm going to pray and then we're dismissed. Father, our, we, our Jonathan's going to come up. Father, I'm so thankful for your grace. I'm so thankful for your love for us. I'm so thankful, God, for your word. And I'm so thankful for the gospel. That we don't have to prove ourselves, God. That Jesus has proven himself. Through faith in Jesus, we prove ourselves. We don't, we don't have to live in some sort of fear of, of not earning your favor. God, you, you show us favor because of the work of Jesus. God, I thank you for that. God, you satisfy us because of Jesus. So I thank you for that. I thank you that Jesus is the one who has gone before us, who has lived a perfect life that none of us could live, who died in our place on the cross and who rose again so that we could have life and victory and joy. And God, I just pray you would help us this week to turn from everything else we trust in and to run to Jesus. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Josh. As we think about uh, Josh's message this morning, and you know, a couple of things that really stuck out to me is just that how Jesus changes everything, and we think about those idols that we make in our life and how we can Turn that over to him. I think this song speaks perfectly to that. I'd love it if you'd stand and sing with me. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me as we think about the song Graves in the Garden. So would you stand and sing with me as we respond to the message this morning? I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. But you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. And I'm not afraid to show you my weakness. Failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still come.
call me friend Cause the God of the mountain Is the God of the valley There's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again Oh, there's nothing Better than you, there's nothing better than you, or there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, there's nothing better than you, or there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. Would you sing that with me? You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's Nothing is better than you. Let's sing that one more time. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Thank you for singing with me. You can be seated for just a minute as I remind us about a couple of things uh, coming up this week. Uh, first off, if you're new this morning, uh, we'd love to connect. Um, I'll be out in the foyer behind the uh, building behind the service, or after the service. And uh, Josh, I'd invite you to join me uh, back there in the back after the service. So we'd love to just say hi on your way out, um, whether it's your first time here or if you're uh, one of our regulars here with us, we'd just love to connect. So uh, come and see us after the service uh, out in the back. Uh, Josh, thanks again for being here with us this morning and sharing our message. So I hope you'll come uh, say hi to him on your way out this morning. Uh, also, Wednesday, we'll have our Wednesday prayer and Bible study. Uh, we'll be meeting over in the Christian Life Center, uh, 11 o'clock, um, in the Christian Life Center, the first room on the right, the fireside room. Uh, if you haven't joined us before, we'd love to have you. I know many of you come every week and look forward to having you there. We'll have Ray Fairchild back with us again this week. Uh, so we're looking forward to continuing a study on Jacob that we started and we're going to continue for the next couple weeks. So hope you'll join us for that. And I think that's everything that I wanted to remind you about this week. It's kind of a normal week for us, uh, but we're just so glad that all of you are here and worshiping with us. Uh, as we dismiss, let's stand, and we're going to sing just the end of that song together, uh, Graves in the Gardens. So would you stand as we can conclude our service together? So you turn morning into dancing. You turn morning dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can you turn morning to dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into 
highways, you're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. One more time. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Have a great week. Thanks for being with us today.